Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by Las Vegas Motor Speedway, America's racing showplace. There's nothing wrong with being compared to David Pearson. I mean, in my mind. Richard would come up to Daddy and whisper in his ear, Hey, you ain't crap. <laughs> and Daddy would turn around and say, Oh, you ain't crap. I was not happy that he was suspended. Really? I was not. Uh, I honestly think that I was going to win anyway. That was the end of the announce. I, I, man, that, that tore me up because he had gotten hurt. and I, 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 It wasn't my fault, but I, I, I blame myself for putting those bananas in his seat. The day NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past, that's the day we don't have any future. So, Larry, what is your earliest memory of your daddy being involved in racing? The earliest memory was back uh, in the 50s, um, late 50s. I remember him racing at at Greenville Pickens Speedway. It was dirt. And uh, he had a 37 Ford, light blue, red numbers. Number was 16A. And uh, that's the earliest I can remember. Now, how often do you, did you go to the races? And what kind of shenanigans did you get into once you were there? Uh, no shenanigans. Uh, I'd, well, when I was younger, I went to the local races where he, before we started racing NASCAR uh, every weekend at, at Greenville. Uh, When he moved up to NASCAR, we didn't go so much. I had started school, and um, I don't know, Dad, he he went off on his own and took a couple of guys with him, and me and Mom and my my brother, Ricky, uh, we stayed at home. Eddie wasn't born until 1965, so uh, we just stayed home, and I went to school and things. Now, once you did go to the races, the Grand National races, who were some of the other kids that you kind of hung around with? Or did you hang around with anybody? Else? Yeah. Uh, Dale Jarrett, uh, Michael Scott, who was Wendell Scott's son. Really? Okay. Yep. Uh, that's a really about all I can remember. I don't remember hanging out with Kyle that much. Well, you are a little bit older than him, weren't you? Yeah, uh, just uh, yeah. maybe a half a year. But uh, no, I'm teasing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, Davey, Davey was younger. Uh, mostly it was just uh, Dale Jarrett and Michael Scott. And we used to set cups up in the infield and would have foot races around in the dirt and race around those cups on foot. And uh, that was a lot of fun back then. I mean, that's all we had to do. Tell me about the families. How, how much did you hang around each other in the infield, picnicking or, or anything like that? Did you ever do much of that? No, not without the race drivers, okay. uh, families. No, we never did that. Uh, normally, we would just have our own little picnic. Mama would uh, would cook or uh, make sandwiches and stuff and drinks for us to, to eat. And uh, we just ate amongst ourselves. Now, was that by design or were you just introverted or did you not want to <laughs> pal around with anybody, any other drivers? Uh, families. Me? Well, the family. My family. Yes. I thought you were talking about Dad's family. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, which one? Dad's family. When you were a kid going to the races and not going to picnics or not hanging around the other families, was that because your daddy didn't want you hanging around anybody? No. Okay. No. I mean, he didn't care if we hung out. Yeah. Uh, But mostly it was just the kids that hang out. Uh, Mom pretty much stayed to herself, as did Linda Petty and and Martha Jarrett, and uh, they... I don't remember anything about them actually hanging out together. Uh, but us kids, we did. Tell me a really good Dale Jarrett story from back then. I could outrun him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Other than that, I really can't tell you. I mean, that was a long, long time ago. Uh, 
I really don't know. I mean, he was a super nice guy. He was fun to hang out with, as was Michael Scott. Yeah. And uh, we just, we had a good time together as far as playing around in the infield. How soon did the racing bug hit you? When did you know that you wanted to race? I knew that I wanted to race cars when I was a junior in high school. Uh, I tried to go to as many races as I could or as many races as my dad would let me. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, I started racing um, the baby grand cars. And how that started was my dad had a, a, a race up in Asheville, North Carolina, a sportsman race, and the baby grand cars were racing up there. And David Watson had a car painted at Black Dad's 21, and Dad went and asked him, could I practice in the car? And I went up there, and I practiced, you know, run a couple of laps, and everybody was passing me on every side, and apparently I wasn't going fast enough. And it was very nerve-wracking. So, you know, I, did, I really didn't know after that if I wanted to race. But then David Watson came and asked me, did I want to, want to run the next week at uh, North Wilkesboro? So I said, yeah, sure. So I went to North Wilkesboro. I was running second uh, to Dean Combs at that time. And, well, Dean won most of the races at Wilkesboro. But I was running second, and I had a flat tire. And that's when I knew, actually, that I could – I could do it, and I wanted to do it. So you were running second in your first race ever after having just a handful of laps? Correct. I was running second at North Wilsboro. All right. Cool. Now, you mentioned the fact that your uh, that, that Holman Moody or Ford gave your dad this car here, correct? Right. Now, ha- how much did that have to do with you wanting to get into racing? <laughs> <laughs> well, that particular car – which is a 68 or 69 Ford Torino. It has a 428 Cobra Jet engine. And I drove it to high school. And I was racing. Me and a friend of mine was in the car coming back from a football game. And I was racing uh, a Mach 1. And I got up to 140. And I backed out of it. And, of course, we beat, beat the Mach 1. He got off the next exit. And we kept going. And I just... Wanted to see how fast I could go. And at 140, I, I backed out. And I just, I don't know. I just, it, it, was, it felt really, really good to run that fast. And uh, Now, at 140, so, you weren't pegged, though, were you? No, I was not. I was not <laughs> pegged at 140. It would have kept going. The speedometer went all the way around. <laughs> and then some more. And that was enough. How did you wind up behind the wheel racing and Ricky and Eddie turning riches? Well, Ricky had always been interested in mechanics, the mechanic side. Uh, When Dad would work uh, on his sportsman car, Ricky was the crew chief, and he seemed to take an interest in that, and he learned a lot. He also learned a lot from other teams that he worked for or would go to the races with. He would go with Butch Lindley. He would go with Jack Ingram. Uh, and they taught him a lot also. But most of it came from my dad. And uh, I always wanted to be a driver. Ricky did try racing. Uh, one time in the Baby Grand Division, Dad built him a car. And at North Wilkesboro also, uh, Dad and Ricky had gone to Las Vegas. Dad was getting a... Uh, an award or something out there and they were having a race at North Wilkesboro the car that I was driving was torn up uh, from a previous wreck and wouldn't be ready so I asked dad and Rick could I take Ricky's car to North Wilkesboro and race it and they were hesitant but I took it anyway and I crashed it (laughs) I uh, well I got spun out and backed it into the wall and destroyed everything about that car and so ricky's racing career was over uh and just uh, i mean he just decided that you know he was going to work on cars and i can say that with without him i would not have won as many races as i did 
and wouldn't have won two championships. I mean, he was the the spark plug behind the race team. You, you talked about getting into grand uh, baby grands. Was there ever any consideration into actually just going ahead and jumping into the what was then the Winston Cup division right off? Because that was at a time when you could kind of sort of do that. Yeah, no. I uh, First of all, I didn't want to. And second of all, my dad wouldn't let me. He okay. would not let me race up in the Winston Cup until he, until he felt like I was ready. Okay. And I felt the same way, yeah. which was 1989. Right. Um, but the time in the in which is now the Xfinity Series, it was Bush, Bush Series back then, and I still call it the Bush Series. Uh, it was great. I mean, racing for your family, being around with your two brothers, Ricky and Eddie, and the guys that we had working with us at the time, which was only a couple, not like today where you have hundreds of people working. We had uh, me, Ricky, and Eddie in the shop plus two other guys, and we ran a full schedule. Yeah. And we only had two cars. So, I mean, but it was great. I mean, we were – the other two guys that worked with us, even though they weren't family, they were treated like family, and it was, it was really – uh, probably one of the best times of my life racing. If I'm not mistaken, could, from what I could find online, you got your first baby grand win in 1975 at Rockingham? Probably. I won a lot of races at Rockingham. Okay. All right. Uh, that's um, probably where it was. What year did you start? Was that your first year racing? Baby? No, I think I started in 74. Okay. All right. So what do you remember about that first win, if anything? Whew. Rockingham. Uh, honestly, I, not much. Uh, 74 at Rockingham. I was racing J.V. Reigns. Uh, Didn't he work for Junior at one time? He did. J.V. Okay. Wor- yeah. worked with Junior. And his brother Shane Reigns, Dean Combs. Larry Hoopal. Uh, it was a very strong field. Yeah. Uh, but on the big tracks, I could run with those guys. But on the smaller tracks, uh, we really didn't have the handling, I'll say, that, that we needed for the smaller tracks. But we had the horsepower on the bigger tracks. All right. You walked a road – that only a handful of drivers have been down, sons and brothers of the sports, all-time greats being compared to your, to their dads. There was Richard Petty and Lee. There was Kyle and Richard. There was Dale Earnhardt Jr., Kerry and Dale Sr. There was Davey and Bobby and Michael Waltrip and Darrell. How much pressure, if any, did you feel to live up to what your dad had accomplished? I didn't feel any pressure. Uh, I always wanted to be like him or maybe even outdo him, which there was no way I was going <laughs> Good to. Good luck with that. Yeah, <laughs> really. There was no way I was going to, but I, I, I tried. Yeah. I yeah, tried yeah. to. But uh, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with being compared to David Pearson. I mean, in my mind. Uh, that was my goal, to be like him, to try to win as much as him, to win as many championships and uh but you know it just wasn't meant to be but i'm very satisfied with what i've done in racing how did he offer help very often or did he expect you to figure it out on your own uh he offered help when i asked okay uh the biggest mistake (laughs) that we made was letting him be my spotter (laughs) now i don't know if Richard ever spotted for Kyle or Ned ever spotted for Dale or Dale for Dale Jr. I don't know. Yeah. But it got so bad that we started giving Dad a radio that was half charged. (laughs) And his radio would go out. And then he started asking for two radios. And we started giving him two radios that were half charged just so I wouldn't have to listen to his. I'm going to tell you one more time, boy, how to get into that corner. (laughs) 
So we was at Charlotte, and that's what he told me. Come over to the radio. And he said, look here. He said, get into that first turn. You have got to get higher to enter the corner. And I said, I'm as high as I can go. He said, no, we're not. So a caution came out. He said, all right. I was coming down the front stretch, and he said, okay, get up close to the wall. And I was up close to the wall, and he said, closer. So I got up a little closer. He said, closer. And I said, I'm going to hit the wall. He said, get up closer. And I, <laughs> I scraped the wall. He Not said, that close. <laughs> he said, he said, I said, I hit the wall. He said, why'd you do that? I said, because you, you told me to keep getting closer. So, I mean, things like that. Yeah. I yeah. mean, he would just, uh, I would get aggravated sometimes with him spotting for me. But, you know, it is what it is, and I enjoyed everything that he did teach me. And, you know, it, it, it was great to have him around. All right, so I know David Pearson from the outside looking in. Uh, a lot of people in the sport knew him from the outside looking in. Who was David Pearson at home? Was he a strict daddy? Was he <laughs> was he like just go go ahead and tell me about it later? Or he was not strict. Mama was the disciplinarian. Hello. <laughs> he would go. He would let us go and learn by our mistakes. Okay. He was that type of person. And the mistakes that we made, we never done again because, you know, we learned from it. But Mama was the, she was a disciplinarian. What's your best Mama disciplinarian story? <laughs> uh, throwing rocks at us. <laughs> uh, we were somewhere... I forgot what we were doing, something in the yard. Yeah. And she was telling us to come in the house, you know, not to get grass stains on our jeans. And we didn't care. I mean, man, when I was little, we had holes in our jeans, well, ripped that's jeans the now. That's the fashion. That's the fashion now. <laughs> My God, if I'd have kept them things, I could have made $100 off <laughs> each, one, each one of those jeans now. But uh, we wouldn't go in. So, I mean... Bless her heart. She was an old country girl. I mean country. And so she just picked up a pile of rocks and started throwing them at us and to make us come in the house. So, How many rocks did it take? Just a couple. She was a pretty good shot. <laughs> Sometimes there just aren't enough rocks. Yeah. <laughs> from what I found online, also, you had at least some sponsorship from the baby grand days from Louise Smith. Yes. Now, how did that come about? I had known Louise a while before I started racing. I knew her from the racetracks because she would always go to most of the races. And I had known her for a while, and we became pretty good friends. So I just asked her to, you know, buy me a set of tires here and there. And she was she was able to do that. Uh, tires for the baby grand cars, they were only $100 a piece. So, I mean, it's $400. Yeah. And uh, so she helped me out a lot, a lot doing that. What kind of person was she? Louise, very giving. Very giving person. Uh, she was sweet. Uh, she'd take a drink every now and then. <laughs> and uh, very funny after she did that. Very funny person. After she did that? After she did that. She was, she was fun to hang around. Now, did she offer any driving advice? No. Really? No. Okay. Louise never offered any advice at all as far as driving. Uh, don't know that she could. All right. uh, her cars were a lot different. <laughs> <laughs> you were at the 1976 Daytona 500 where David and Richard had that famous get-together in turn four on the last lap. What do you remember about those last few laps in the aftermath? Well, I noticed that... Uh, Richard was pulling away from Dad a little bit, with about three to go, maybe. Uh, on the last lap, going down the back stretch, I was in the pits. Eddie Wood looked at me, and he said, David said he can't get him. 
So I did. I I knew then that you know it was probably going to finish second. Uh, you couldn't see turn three and four, so I had no idea what was going on. And uh, all of a sudden, I heard the crowd jump up and yell. So I knew something had happened. And then I saw Richard's car coming down the front stretch, spinning against the wall and stopping the infield. Still didn't see Dad. And then all of a sudden, here he comes through the infield grass and, and crosses the finish line. And that was a uh, big, big day. Awesome. <sighs> Obviously, everybody knows David Pearson, Richard Petty. Richard Petty, David Pearson, they know about all the first and second place finishes and they know that there was a a friendly rivalry I don't think it was ever overheated or anything mm. like that how did you feel about Richard Petty were, were, did you ever think hey you can't race my dad like that or anything like that no okay right. no never uh, Richard was a he was a, a clean race car driver okay and Bobby Isaac was my dad's best friend when they started racing together. They traveled together. I mean, they, they not in the same room, but they stayed at the hotels, the same hotel together. They ate together. And when Bobby died, uh, he became close with Richard. And to be honest with you, they were, they were not brothers, but they acted like it. Really? Yeah. They Richard were, Petty and David Pearson? Richard Petty and David Pearson were wow. really, really friendly and close. They really was. And wow. they never raced each other dirty. Um, I mean, you have to earn respect right. out there racing. And uh, so they raced each other clean. And Daddy knew that if he, he, if he was going to win, he had to beat Richard. Except at Darlington. And <laughs> for some reason, he knew he was going to win Darlington. But, uh, yeah, they were very, very close. Did they, hang, did they actually hang out? Or were... I don't think they actually okay. hung out together. Okay. Uh, except at the racetrack. Right. Wow. And Richard would come up to Daddy and whisper in his ear, hey, you ain't crap. <laughs> and Daddy would turn around and say, oh, you ain't crap. Uh -huh. You know, they would, they would tease each other like that. So, yeah, I mean, it was a very good relationship that they have or had. In 1978, you finished second in the baby grand standings to Larry Hoopaw, and you won three races. Were you comfortable behind the wheel at that point, or were you still learning? No, I, I was very comfortable then. Okay. I was ready to move, wanted to move up to the Sportsman Series. And I, apparently my dad felt it wasn't. I wasn't ready yet. Now, here's what happened. My dad had a race at Hickory. We went up the day before to test. Late model. Late model okay. car. We went up to test. He was done testing. The car was sitting on pit road. I said, Dad, he said, I'm gonna, I, I told him, I said, I'm going to get in your car and I'm going to take it a few laps. He said, no, you won't. I said, yeah, I really will. He said, go ahead. So I jumped in that car, took a few laps, and I was just as fast as he was. So Now, how did he react to that? <laughs> honestly, he didn't say anything. And the reason I know that is when I was coming in, I saw Ricky show him the stopwatch. And his reaction was <laughs> like that. Yeah. So that's how it all started. So how did you react to him not wanting you to make the move up? Did, did, you, did you go to him and say, Dad, come on, I'm ready did, did you try to negotiate with him? Or? Well, what happened? Let me see. I was also, during my baby grand racing, I was also running a sportsman car at a little track up in Harris, North Carolina, which okay. is only about 45 minutes, just across the border in North Carolina. And I would go there and race, not every Saturday, but quite often. And you would have big-time guys show up there when they had a double points race. Uh, Morgan Shepard, Butch, would be there. Don't know that Jack ever came. Bob Presley, he would come. And I would have to race against those guys. I finished second every dead gum time to them guys. Yeah. Every dead gum time. 
And so I got used to running faster cars at the time. And in 1982 or 83, Dad let me race at Charlotte. I mean, that wasn't my first race, but he let me race at Charlotte. And I don't know what happened, but I don't know. I did race. I don't know where I finished or how I finished or whatever. You kept running into the wall. I did that a lot. (laughs) Yes, I did. I crashed a lot. (laughs) Oh, man. So when you did make it to the Budweiser Late Model Sportsman, Bush Late Model Sportsman, what's now the Xfinity Series in 1982 and 83, were you – were you still racing Baby Grand, or were you still running the sportsman car? Or No. Okay. No, when I moved up to the Bush Series, I stayed in the Bush Series. Okay. How much of a step up in competition was that for you? Ooh, big time. Okay. Big time, tough. The first race that I ran in the Bush Series was at South Boston, Virginia, and you had Ingram, you had – Tommy Ellis, you had Houston, you had, I think Sam was running then, Sam Ard. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it was, I finished 14th. That's just to let you know how bad it was. And which, I don't know. I, I was wanting to finish better, but, you know, 14th in your first race, I don't guess that's too bad. But after that, after that race, I was. I knew right then that I could I could do it. You did get your first Bush win at Hickory in 1984, and then you got another couple of wins the following year, and you finished third in the standings behind Jack Ingram and Jimmy Hensley. What did that do for your confidence? Had you had you arrived at that point? Well, I hope so. I mean, I, okay. I was I was trying to. You you never know if you've arrived or not. Yeah. It just depends on how your competitors treat you and how they race you. Uh, but I, they race me with respect, and I race them with respect. And I, I felt very comfortable racing around those guys. Um, but you go to different tracks, and there was always someone – someone else to beat like at Hickory Orange County and well some more tracks I guess you had to beat Jack uh, when you go to South Boston or Langley Field in Virginia you had to beat Tommy Ellis when you go to Martinsville I had to contend with Brett Bodine yeah uh, this depends on what track you go to different drivers were really good at that particular track and so that's who I tried to beat, depending on what track we were at. Did you have a specific moment in the Bush Series when you felt like you did belong? Was there one specific moment, or did that just come over time? Well, where I did belong in the Bush Series, probably probably 85 I mean, the first race in 84 that I won at Hickory, Ingram was right on my tail for the last 20 laps. He probably could have taken me out, but we were friends, and he gladly decided not to, which I was glad he he didn't. I mean, I wasn't holding him up, but uh, he did bump me a couple of times, but not hard enough to spin me out. But probably I knew that I belonged there in 85. Did you ever have a sense that that drivers raced you any differently because of your last name? Did they ever race you harder because they wanted to beat David Pearson's son? Or was that just not even a fact? No, that I don't, I don't, I hope not. Okay. Uh, I mean, heck, every one of them guys raced me hard. <laughs> and not just because of who I was. I mean, right, they raced right. me hard okay. because they wanted to win. They wanted to win just like I did. So, uh, no, I don't think they raced me harder because of who I was. Okay. All right. You mentioned Ricky 
and Eddie uh, working on the race team. What was your relationship like with them as Ricky as crew chief and Eddie working on the team? Eddie took care of the tires. He was the tire specialist. Ricky obviously was the crew chief and did most of the work on the car. Uh, the relationship, just like it is right now, it was great. I mean, we all get, we still get along. Uh, no squabbling. Occasionally we'll talk about the past, things that we did, things that we accomplished. Uh, but no, I mean, it's no different now than it was back then, which it was great. Now, who had the final say on what went on the car? Was it you or Ricky or your dad, or was it truly a team effort? Uh, it wasn't Daddy. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, try, we tried to set it up when he wasn't around. Uh, he was still trying to figure out the radios. Why his radios yeah, well, kept going dead. Probably. <laughs> probably. Uh, you know, I don't think we ever told him about that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, Ricky. Okay. Ricky set the car up, and we'd go to the track, and I would tell him what the car was doing, and he would make adjustments. All right. 1986 after Dover, you're third in the standings, 265 points behind Jack Ingram, six races left, I think. So it was going to be an uphill battle if, if you won that championship. But Jack heads to Asheville. He runs a race there. And all hell breaks loose. Um, <laughs> how did you find out about what had happened, and what was your reaction to him being suspended? Uh, I was not happy that he was suspended. Really? I was not. Uh, I honestly think that I was going to win anyway. Really? I really did. I was on a hot streak. Jack was fading. Uh, his last few finishes that he did race weren't that good and i think he was on a downward trend and i was on an upward trend and i honestly think that if not beat him i would have made it interesting so rather than some yahoo coming in and saying well you won that championship okay all right no i don't agree with that you won the championship you did win the championship that season what did that mean to you personally? Oh, everything. Uh, my first win in 1984 at Hickory, that was my special event. That's, that's what I really take pride in because it was the Bobby Isaac Memorial and Bobby and Daddy were, were, were good friends, close friends then. But the winning the championship, it, it, it took a lot of weight off my shoulders and the family shoulders, and I think that it proved to a lot of people that we were there to stay. You did beat out Brett Bodine for the championship that year, and at some point he stole your lucky Chattanooga Chew cap. Brett. Now, first, first of all, from what I understand, you were pretty much the king of superstitions. What were some of them that you had? What what all was taboo to Larry Pearson? I did have a lucky hat, and Brett did steal it. <laughs> uh, same hat I wore had worn all year. Uh, but I did get it back. I got it back. Uh, some other things that I did, I wore the same pair of underwear <laughs> if i had won the week previously i wore the same underwear as the next week and i did wash them but i did mark them with a sharpie uh i always put my left shoe on first uh and then you've got your typical things yeah. i mean the, the color green i would never drive a green race car no peanuts at the racetrack on race day. Uh, walking under a ladder, black cats. $50 bills? $50 bills, although I'd probably take a bucket of them now. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, it, it's just, just silly things, but it meant a lot to me back then. How did that come about? 
was was that at least in part from your dad, or did it just develop over time with other people? Uh, the hat and underwear thing came. I, it was from me. Okay, I did that. The peanuts, the green cars, the fifty dollar bills that came from dad. Really? Yeah. Okay. He uh, back in when he was racing at Greenville Pickens, some guy and I don't have any idea who it was had a green car. And he went through the fence, and apparently he got hurt pretty seriously. I don't think he died. But from that moment on, Daddy said he did not want a green car. And his superstitions passed on to me. Are you still superstitious? Well, with the black cats, yes. Black cat crosses in front of me, I'll put an X on my windshield. Uh, the peanuts don't matter anymore because I'm not racing. $50 bills, like I said, I'd take a bucket of them now. <laughs> uh, still have my lucky Chattanooga Chew hat. Do you really? I do. Uh, do not wear the same underwear every day now. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. <laughs> All right, so about the cap, what was your reaction to Brett taking your cap? Well, I knew he had it. I okay. knew he had it. Uh I don't. Uh, I talked to one of the uh, other guys on his uh, on his crew, and they're actually the one that gave it back to me. Of course, I had to give him five dollars, <laughs> but uh, it was no big deal. I mean, we used to do things with each other, Brett and I, and Mike Alexander. He and I. He. Oh, he, we'll we'll he get would, to Mike Alexander. We'll get to Mike. I'm sure, I'm sure you will. <laughs> and uh, but we we were we were jokesters. We used to play with jokes on each other all the time. Nothing serious that would hurt right. anyone, yeah. except the one time uh, me and Mike Alexander we we were running terrible. If I was running terrible, I'd get a bunch of couple of bananas and put in his seat. Try to get the monkey off your back. Right. And he would do the same thing, put bananas in my seat, and you know, just to get the luck away, bad luck away from you. Uh, I forgot where we were racing, but I had a terrible week, and I would, went up and put bananas in his seat. And the next week, he went somewhere to race a all pro race or something. The snowball derby. The snowball derby. Yeah. Is that where he got hurt? Yeah. Yeah. Mike got yeah. hurt there. And that was the end of the bananas. Cause I, man, that, that tore me up because he had gotten hurt. And I, 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 it wasn't my fault, but I, I, I blame myself for putting those bananas in his seat. Wow. And that hurt, that, that hurt bad. 